Norman Chan. This case takes place in Australia. On April 13, 1991, it was a school holiday, and 13-year-old Carmen Chan found herself home alone, babysitting her younger sisters. The other two girls were just nine and seven. Carmen's parents owned a local Chinese restaurant, and so it wasn't unusual for Carmen to be alone with the kids at night. She was pretty responsible for her age, so it wasn't unusual to find Carmen holding down the fort at home alone with the siblings. On that Saturday evening, Carmen was recovering from having the flu. She was trying to take it easy, so they were just hanging out in her room. The girls were watching a documentary about Marilyn Monroe. Around that time, the two sisters decided to go into the kitchen and get themselves a glass of water. The two younger girls, Carly and Karen, found a masked man standing in the kitchen, much to their horror. His head was covered with fabric and he had stitching around his eyes and his mouth that was described as terrifying and imposing. Even worse, he was standing there holding a large knife. He then said to the girls, I won't hurt you, and they began to relax a little bit, wanting to believe him. This pause was exactly what he wanted, and he proceeded to grab the two girls and he dragged them into a dark wardrobe, which he used to barricade the girls off. As they huddled together in fear, Carmen was forced out onto the street at knife point. The two girls would eventually escape, but by then Carmen was gone. On the way out, the masked predator painted the cars outside with the messages, payback, more to come, an Asian drug deal. It's important to note that there is zero indication the Chans were involved in drugs at all. The police believe this was either done as a red herring in hopes of throwing the police off or possibly just a cruel thing to hurt the Chans and trying to twist blame on them in the eyes of those left behind. The police responded quickly to this case and they brought dogs to the scene in hopes of tracing her steps. Carmen's scent was tracked through the house, past the family's Toyota Camry outside, past the garden, the tennis court, and then out to the street. Unfortunately, the trail stopped about 320 yards away, which is about 300 meters. This likely means the man who took her had a vehicle nearby. The case, unfortunately, quickly grew cold. It eventually just diminished to the point the police were begging for clues to be called in, and they did chase all of the leads, but they led nowhere. It would be almost a year to the day that a dog walker would stumble across a skull at the State Electricity Commission Terminal Station, which was located near the Chan's home. It was the dog the woman was walking that would discover the skull in the area, which had garbage piled on top of it, which is likely why it hadn't been noticed before. And just like that, all the hopes for the Chan family was gone. DNA went on to confirm that the skull belonged to Carmen. She had been shot three times in the head and was buried in a shallow grave. The police believe she had been located there ever since the day that she went missing. This case had a ripple effect for the entire community of Melbourne. Parents found themselves living in constant fear for their children. And they were right to be afraid because the man in the mask was tied to about a dozen incidents before Carmen was ever taken. In those incidents, however, the children survived. The man in the mask was escalating. The first case was four years prior. It took place on August 22, 1987. This is when a man in the similar mask broke into a home in Lower Plenty. He tied up two parents and their six-year-old son. He then proceeded to force an 11-year-old girl to brush her teeth before he assaulted her. It appears that Australia has different laws regarding underage victims' names being released. In research for this case, I found the name of the other victims who survived listed a lot. Rather than saying their names myself, however, I'm going to call the first girl Alice. 16 months after the first case, Alice was kidnapped. The man entered her home, gagging and tying up her two parents before entering Alice's bedroom. She woke up to see a gun pointed at her. This took place in Ringwood, Victoria. It was clear he had stalked the family to some degree and Alice was the target. Once he came in, it was clear that he knew Alice's real name and he knew more things about her. He placed tape on her mouth and her eyes and drug her outside. The parents were able to break free finally and summon the police, but Alice was gone. Nearly a full day would pass before she was found outside a local school, dressed in a man's shirt and trash bags. She would later tell the police that her kidnapper forced her to shower and brush her teeth before assaulting her. He also forced her to remain blindfolded the entire time. 
18 months later, there was another kidnapping, this time in Canterbury. The child was released at a power station. She reported similar facts as to what happened during her assault and when she was released. I'm always hesitant to give serials any sort of a name because that's what they want, fame. But I've been asked to do it more so that it's clear who we're talking about. In this case, the moniker given to him was Mr. Cruel by the press. When all was said and done, there were upwards of a dozen cases, terrifying parents and families throughout the entire area. There is still a $1 million reward offered for the identification and apprehension of this man. A profile was released to say that he likely appears normal to those around him. Psychiatrists believe there is probably signs of some mental dysfunction, especially regarding adult relationships in his life. They believe he might require role play in order to perform. If you have any information at all on this case, please call Crime Stoppers at the number given. They also have an online form where you can submit an anonymous tip. Carmen's case has gone unsolved for 30 years. That's it for today. Thank you everyone so much for watching and listening. Please take a moment to like and subscribe if you haven't already. We have new episodes every Monday and Thursday. Thursdays are always dedicated to John and Jane Doe cases. Take care of yourselves and each other.